Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar organized by the Ontologies Community of Practice of the CGR platform for Big Data and Agriculture. I'm Celine Ober, and I will facilitate the webinar. Today, Alessandro Mosca from the Free University of Bozen Bolzano will talk about the virtual knowledge graph and especially how to access scientific data stored in a database through the virtual knowledge graph. Alessandro Mosca, assistant professor at the Free University Hi. of Bozen Bolzano. Alessandro research activity focuses on knowledge representation and conceptual modeling for data management. He is interested in the theoretical and methodological aspects behind the creation of ontology-based data management solutions, which are the design of formal ontologies, conceptual modeling languages, and mapping specifications. Over to you, Alessandro. Thank you very much for the introduction, Celine. As the title says, my talk today is about virtual knowledge graph approach. So my main goal today is to give you an introduction, a very, let's say, light and basic introduction to the VKG approach. This means somehow that I'm going to talk about ontologies, but I will not tell you anything related with how ontologies are built. So I will focus on a way somehow to exploit existing ontologies in data management. So in particular, I will focus on two main challenges that we work on in data management that are data access and data integration. I will try not to be very technical. So I hope at least. So if you have, if you want to, to, to know more technical details, just ask at the end of the presentation. I will start with motivations behind our work by means of uh, examples, okay? And then I will move to, let's say, the conceptual framework, which defined the VKG approach. I will tell you something about the main ingredients of the VKG, and I will, at the very end of the talk, introduce the concept of querying by rewriting that is at the basis of, of the approach. Uh, then I will mention some ready-to-use technological solutions that are that exploit this VKG approach, and um, just a final slide about take-home messages. Okay, so challenges in the big data era. Okay, so I I, I don't want actually to introduce the concept of big data here because I, I assume that you are more or less familiar with it. Uh, just let me mention these four V that define somehow that are the specified main characteristics of big data. So we have volume, velocity, veracity, and variety. So as for the present talk, I would like to draw your attention to one of these V, that is variety, or as we call it, heterogeneity. So why is this important? Well, I mean, there are several reports and studies around that says that most of the big data initiatives are driven by the issue of dealing with variety, okay? So, and actually this is the main core, the main focus also of our work. So why, let me switch to heterogeneity because I mean, it's not in the very same mood of the, the four V, okay? So it's a different terms, but to me, it defines better what we are doing. So, and the issues we are trying to tackle. So data model are heterogeneous, right? So we are nowadays, working with data coming from that are stored somehow, not coming from, but stored in very different data models, relational data, graph data, XML, JSON files, CSV files, and also uh, fully unstructured data coming from text files. Then we also have to deal with the heterogeneity of the system. So, from time to time, even, even systems that somehow share the very same data model. So two database management systems that are based on relational model, 
okay? They can be heterogeneous. They can actually use different dialects, for example, or the, of the languages behind. And so this pose, uh, poses que uh, issues somehow and, and challenges for the data management people. So, and then of course the schema are heterogeneous. So people see things in a different way, one from the others. And of course the resulting design of the schema by them is different from one to the other. And also there are, last but not least, I would say data level heterogeneity. So you can find, for example, acronyms used in a certain place instead of the full, let's say, spelling of a, of a given value, such as in this example here. So you, you use IBM versus int dot business machines versus international business machines. Of course, we human, we know that these two, that these three terms are actually denoting the very same thing, but most of the cases, this is not, most of the time, this is not the case for, for a machine, for a computer who doesn't understand this. Okay, so let me give you, uh, let's say a very specific example, very concrete, let's say example, coming from about, how, I mean, the rays of heterogeneity. Uh, the example comes from a project that we, that we had with the Statoil, which is now called Equinor, uh, which is the Norway national company for oil extraction, oil and gas extractions. So in these scenarios, okay, we have geologists at the, at the company that prior to making decisions on drilling new wellborns, so I wasn't aware about the, the meaning of wellborn. So very briefly, where a wellborn is a hole in the terrain that is made mainly for explorative reasons, okay? So before deciding to drill the terrain or not drill the terrain, the geologist at Equinor needs other relevant information about previous drillings. This because actually drilling or making a, a wellboard, a new one is quite costly for the company. So here is my example. Here we have, a, let's say, a scenario where the world is divided in two main pieces. On the left-hand side, we have a domain word. On the right-hand side, we have the IT word. So in the domain word, our geologist is asking for the following. In my geographical area of interest, return whole pressure data tagged with key stratigraphic, stratigraph information with understandable quality control attributes and suitable for further filtering. So this is the request by the geologist. Of course, one thing that we can immediately notice is let's say, the way this request is formulated. So the geologist is formulating his request, her request, in terms of domain knowledge, okay? So knowing you have to know what a stratigraphic unit is, what stratigraph information are, what does it mean to have control attributes, and so on and so forth. So. But, okay, what do we have on the other side of the world? So in the IT, which is actually managing the information by the company that geologists would like to access to, okay? So we have terabytes of relational data. We have more than uh, 1,500 tables, 1,700 views defined over these tables. So each, with dozens of attributes, and somehow this uh, data storage is consulted by 900 geologists in the company, okay? So as you see, it's a quite complex scenario. And the way the geologists usually try to satisfy his request is to call an expert, an IT expert. 
because it doesn't know actually how to deal with this terabyte of relational data and all these tables and views. So at this time, so just after the contact, the geologists start explaining the IT expert, which is his information need. Okay, by most of the time, natural language, so by word, okay? At this time, the IT expert starts formulating SQL queries, okay? Because he has the job to extract the information needed by the geologist from the relational data in the company. Then once this SQL queries has been formulated and specified to the best, let's say, the IT guys execute the, the execute the executes these SQL queries over the database against the databases in the company, retrieve the answers, and then he has to come back to the geologist somehow and providing an answer to her or to him. Um, so this looks quite, let's say, perfect. I don't know. So normal. It's a, it's a quite, let's say, a spread process in our, in the organizations and especially in industry. But we can notice that there are, let's say, a few issues here. So the point is that, I mean, at the time the geologist tried to explain with the IT expert on the basis of air domain knowledge, what she needs. So the translation can actually be not so straightforward because the expert is not supposed to have the domain knowledge of a geologist. He knows how to deal with the relational data in the company, not how to deal with the terrain or the oceans, or let's say the parameters of the terrain outside in the real world. So the understanding of him or her again could be somehow problematic okay so on the basis of this problematic somehow or error prone understanding of the it expert also the formulation the consequent formulation of the sql queries is also somehow prone to errors and the third issues that we see here is that once the expert retrieved the data from the relational storages in the company, the data are in the form of relational table. But somehow he is forced somehow to translate back to the geologist this information in a way that she can actually understand. So, and here we also have another translation step that could actually go wrong, okay? So eventually, after a certain amount of interactions between the geologist and the IT expert, this is the final SQL queries that actually retrieves in the scenario, in the specific scenario I'm talking about, the information needed by the geologist. So this is a pretty optimized SQL version. So it's not really the SQL query you, you would actually start with while exploring, while looking for the information needed by the geologist. But okay, this is just to tell you which is the ideal, let's say, solution to the problem posed by the geologist. So in order to specify somehow this, this query, you have to know quite some things. So for example, the fact that the main table for well burns in the, in the data storage of Equinor has 38 columns, whose names are usually not understandable at all by a human being. So, and then in order to obtain pressure data that were requested by the geologists, it requires four table join with two additional filters. In, in order to obtain stratigraphic information, you actually have to join with five more tables. 
So the results of the first join plus the filters is then joined again further with five more tables. So as you see, I mean, the rhetorical message that I have here is that actually it's very, very, very complicated for people who doesn't have any clue about the way the data are stored in the company they work for to retrieve this data or in other term, to be able to specify this ideal SQL or also suboptimal, let's say, SQL query. So in an industry scenario, like the one I'm talking about, so company knows that actually they are losing, or they, they lose 50 million euros per year due to this problem. Basically because the interactions take time, okay? So instead of having the information the day after, the geologist will have the information two weeks later, okay? And at the cost of all these interactions. So just to tell you that this is not really a problem related with the industrial context, I put here three main examples that comes from very, very, very different scenarios. So here we have a regional government manager. We have a manager or a member of a management board of an higher education and research institution, such as a university. And we have a member of a management body of a funding agency for research and innovation, okay? Such as the European Commission, for example, or a private, let's say, foundation who is actually funding research and innovation activities in their territory, in their country. So let me just focus on the last one. So she says, the research and innovation ecosystem are fast changing, fast growing. I need to know to which frequency the work of the scholars from the research institutions of my region, which receive public fundings for their activity, has also generated a potential for the creation of an economic value, such as patents, okay? So I will not discuss the feasibility or not really the feasibility, the efficacy of this indicator, but this is actually quite spread in the research and innovation and uh, let's say domain. So if you are a scholar in a university, they say you are able to uh, produce a certain economic value for the territory you're working in. If you somehow, if some results of your research got get get I don't know led to uh, a, a registration of a patent or a registration of a patent by someone else is actually citing your results, scientific results. So think about the fact. I will not go into the detail of this example, but think about the fact that if you want to retrieve evidence or information or data uh, to answer this information needs, then you have to look for the scholars in your institutions, look for the uh, funded research project they have been participated in, look for the results of these projects, such as publications, for example, or reports, or deliverables, then go to a public repository of patents, such as SESPACENET, is, is, an open, is an open repository for patents in Europe, and then cross this information with the information you find them, and look for authors of papers that are mentioned or cited in patents, or as even more straightforward, you look for inventors of this patent that are actually scholars of your institution that have been publicly funded. So you have to mix a lot of different data sets that are structured in very different ways that are stored and managed by different people. So again, heterogeneity is here, is present, and it poses a lot of issues in terms of data access and data integration. So as I said here, heterogeneity is not sectarian, is really everywhere. And it's a cross domain, let's say, issue. So how do we actually address heterogeneity? 
uh, we combine three key ideas. So first, we use a global schema and we map the data sources that we are interested in or that we think are useful to answer a certain information need to this global schema. Then we adopt what we call a very flexible data model for the global schema, which is called knowledge graph. Okay, the vocabulary of this knowledge graph is expressed in an ontology. We exploit virtualization. So the knowledge graph in our approach is not materialized. I will tell you more later about that. So this actually so gives rise to what we call the VKG approach, the virtual knowledge graph approach for data accessing and data integration. So to be honest, and also to, let's say, point you to, let's say, uh, seminal papers about this approach, the approach was called ontology-based data access and integration approach, OBDA, until, until basically the time where Google decided to come up with the knowledge graph terms. <laughs> so I'm joking, but we rebranded somehow these OBDA uh, terms with the VKG uh, uh, terms. So here is a reference as a survey about OBDA, and I leave you the reference here in the slides if you want to go in the detail. Uh, so here we have our final users. Okay, so let me give you the basics of the VKG. We have data sources. So in the traditional approach, the users somehow is forced to query directly the data sources. In the VKG approach, we introduce this global schema, right? The knowledge graph. So think about the knowledge graph as something, as a computational artifact, including both the ontology. So the vocabulary somehow used to represent the data and the data themselves, okay? So here I'm stressing the fact that the ontology is present here. And the user now can query the ontology to retrieve his information, the information she needs. Why? Because as I was saying, the data sources are mapped to the ontology, to the entities in the ontology, okay? So here we have the three basic ingredients of a VKG approach that are the ontology, the mappings, and the data sources. This is of course actually providing a way for the final user to query the ontology instead of querying the data sources greatly simplifies the access to the information. And why? Well, basically because this ontology, this global model somehow is specified in a terminology that is fully understandable by the users. So if this is the geologist we were looking at before, this would be an ontology written in a terminology in the, let's say, written on the basis of the domain knowledge I was mentioning before by the geologist. So perfectly understandable by her or by him. And also actually it somehow allows the final users to not have to deal with the specific implementation and the structure of the data in the repositories of the company, okay? Uh, this is just to tell you that we are not going to, so then, I mean, one can think, uh, well, the final, the user, the geology is now is completely independent. It doesn't need any more of the help or the support of the IT guys. Uh, actually, this is not the case. We, we did not fire actually the IT experts, but we introduced yet another person in the circle, which is called knowledge engineer or was called when I was young, knowledge engineer. Now I, I heard something like knowledge scientist or knowledge data scientist. So there are several variants of this term, but I mean, I like the term knowledge engineer. So which is the role of this knowledge engineer? So basically is to help the IT guys and the geologists to build these ingredients or at least two of them. So the mappings and the ontology. This guy 
is a is a very specific persona, let's say, in this scenario. Sorry, because he has to somehow he has to be able to understand what the geologist is saying, and he also, on the other side, he must be able to understand what the IT guy is saying. So the role is you can think about this role as a bridge somehow, okay, or a facilitator between these two worlds that in my previous slides were completely somehow detached. If you want to know more about the concept of knowledge engineer in the present time, and in specifically with respect to the knowledge graph and the creation of knowledge graph, I strongly recommend you this book by Juan Sequeda and Lassila, which is very recent from last year and very, very well written. So this is just, uh, uh, I, I add a bit more of details on the architecture. It's exactly the same architecture as before, but with more details, okay? And I introduced this to tell you a few things. First, the data sources are not somehow restricted to be relational data sources in the VKG approach. So as you see here, we are actually able to integrate somehow and to map to the ontology different formats from spreadsheet files, CSV files, JSON, so on and so forth, vector, geospatial data, such as SHP. And currently we have a line of research, an active line of research, working on uh, the integration and access of uh, raster data or multidimensional array data. The second thing I wanted to point you out here is that, as you see here, it appears another option. So that is the materialized one. So we go almost as, as much as possible with the virtual approach instead of the materialized approach. So in the virtual approach, the data are somehow, the graph of the data, the data graph, is generated on demand. So as soon as the query is executed against the system, the system takes care of creating this graph. In a materialized approach, actually, <clears throat> the data are indeed materialized. And if you wants to update somehow, if, because some of the data sources change or got updated, then you have, again, to start the materialization process again. So if you're working in a company like Equinor, you can imagine how much this is going to cost you in terms of time and computational resources. Then my last comment on this slide is about the top part of this, of this diagram. So here you see there is a bus so and a bunch of possible interfaces on top of it. This means that our final users can actually exploit one of these interfaces and possibly more that I did not list here to access their data. As soon as the interface is able somehow to send queries, Sparkle queries in particular, and receive results in RDF format. Then if this is possible, such as in R, you will have specific libraries to do that. Uh, same in Python, same if you are a user of a Jupyter notebook, you will be able actually to write down your Sparkle query in the Jupyter notebook, connect to, uh, the, to our system and send the queries to the system and get back the results. Okay, let me go further. So which are again, let me repeat the main ingredients here. We have the knowledge graph, the ontology plus the data graph. We have the mappings and we have the query. So it's part of our job, let's say, to decide which are the languages, the formal languages, the most suited formal languages to express these three ingredients. And as you see here, we are actually relying on standards. Okay, this is a good point. I would say. So the knowledge graph is going to be represented in RDF, the ontology is an OWL2QL, 
ontology, which is a profile by the W3C, mappings are in R2, RML, sorry, which is a standard again for, by the W3C and the query language that we are going to use is Firefox that I think you know maybe better than me. Okay, so let me go through this ingredient very fast. This is an example from the organigram of the Grenoble University, if I remember well. This just show you what it means to represent data in RDF, okay? So I don't want to spend time here because I, I, I mean, you are, you are uh, familiar with this concept, okay? So we have a set of triples made following the same structure, subject, predicate, and objects. Ontologies, again, so you know what an ontology is. It's part of your job to design ontology and to work with ontologies. So I do not repeat here things that you already know. Just let me stress this fact that is also somehow represented here by, the, by these logic formulas. For as the ontology is at the end of the day, a logical theory, okay? So it's a bunch of logic formulas written in some logic that could be first order logic or in our cases in description logics. So I will not tell you anything about description logic except that they are a fragment of the first order classical logic, okay? Why is this important? because actually we exploit the fact that an ontology is a logical theory that can produce actually inferences and can provide interesting, let's say, services that we can actually exploit for our data management task. In particular, okay, the description logic that we use is called DL, DL like R, which corresponds to this profile of our two, the, pro, the QL profile. And the reason is that it is considered as a lightweight ontology language. That means that, I mean, the expressive power of this language is somehow controlled. It's not very expressive language. And, but again, as, as, as everyone uh, who knows knowledge representation can, can, can perfectly understand, this control expressive power is counterbalanced by the fact that inference is extremely efficient in this, in this language. So for example, if we want to access large amount of data, so you somehow, you need an ontology language that has this property so that somehow can be translated into SQL query if your data sources are relational data. And you also want a language that somehow <clears throat> is efficient in query answering, okay? So you don't want your user to stay in front of your screen waiting for one hour to get back his result. And this is what actually our 2 ql is providing us. Unfortunately, if you look at the ontology I presented you before, there are axioms that you can actually express in our 2 ql such as the green one here that expresses the disjointness of two concepts, permeability and temperature, but you cannot actually express axioms like the one highlighted in red. So you cannot have actually a conjunction, so uh, intersection in set theory on the right-hand side of your formula, such as in this case here. So you have to be careful because you are allowed to represent something and you are not allowed to express some, let's say, complex constraint in this language. Uh, in general, I mean, here you can find the main constructs of how to QL. You have class hierarchy, domain properties, range properties. And here I put actually all the constraints that you can actually exploit in how to QL. I will leave you for you. So let me move now to probably the most interesting component of, of the BKG approach, that is the mappings, okay? Here in the, bot, in the top part of the slides, I have an ontology, very simple ontology represented as a UML class diagram. And we have two mappings, M1 and M2. What the, okay. So the mappings is a, somehow is an expression made out of two different sub-expressions. 
and I'm moving too much. Okay. Okay. So the first one, as you see here, is an SQL query. Okay. Here you are selecting the M code, M title from the table movie. This is our data set. Sorry, we have two tables, movie and actor, uh, with a filter where the type is M. Okay. And what you want to do with the results that you get back out of the execution of this query is to populate triples in your knowledge graph. So in particular, we are going to populate a triple made of this subject, M slash M code, which is of RDF type movie. And we are also going to populate this second uh, statement here. So M code as title, M title, okay? So you see that the values that I'm going to put under uh, um, to the place of M code and M title are exactly values that I retrieve from the data sources, okay? So if we execute this mapping, okay, against these data sets that you see here, the mapping that we actually uh, generates, the, this mapping generates a number of triples. So as you see, they generate the knowledge graph the virtual knowledge graph I was mentioning before. And in particular, 5118 is of type movie because the M code is this one. And we say, okay, pick up this code and create these statements about RDF type, whose predicate is RDF type, and the object is movie. The same for 2281 and the similarly for the title, okay? As you see, of course, I applied the filter in the SQL query, so I don't care about this A234 movie that is in this table. It would be interesting to go also through the second mapping, but I don't have time. I'm already running out of time. So let me move to the Sparkle query language. Uh, this is an example, let's say, still in the scenario of the Equinor projects I mentioned before. You have somehow, I mean, what is a, what is a Sparkle query? Is a, is, a, is a triple pattern, let's say, including variables. Okay, let me, let me say this way, very, very basic, let's say, a very basic definition of Sparkle query but I think it's understandable. So the query on the left-hand side is it can be represented as a graph. And the main mechanism to, to somehow answer this query is by graph matching, okay? So the engine will try to look into the knowledge graph and match the structure against the knowledge graph and then substitute the actual values to the variables in the query and retrieve back and project back actually the variables that are expressed in the select statement of the query itself. In this case, W and D. Okay, so this is about the expressivity of Sparkle. This is just to somehow sum up all the, the process behind actually how a VKG, which is made of these ingredients, is able to somehow uh, do does do, to, to do his job, okay, his job in this way. So the, the, the users actually formulate a Sparkle query over the ontology, as I said before. This query is somehow rewritten in the first step by the system on the basis of the information that is in the ontology, okay? So it is somehow, you can think about this as an expansion or a completion, okay? So if you in the query have the concept of male and in the ontology, you know that the, every male is also a person, then your query will also be rewritten for searching for person and not only for male. This is because of the knowledge that is in the ontology, okay? So this rewritten query is then unfolded via the mapping. So in a very basic sense, you can think about this step as the fact that the Sparkle query is translated. So the Sparkle queries that you get out of this step are translated into SQL queries. Then the SQL queries are executed against the data sources 
you get back a relational answer from these data sources that thanks to the mapping again, has to be translated back into ontological terms. So the values that you retrieve here from attributes in your table will become objects that are instances of concepts and relationships in your ontology. And only at this time only, then the system will be back to the users with the results of his query execution. So this process is somehow supported by, by, by ready to use technologies. One of these that is actually developed, mainly developed here in Bolzano is called on top. Uh, it, is a, it is an adventure actually started more than 10 years ago in 2009. And we are actually counting something like 5,000 downloads in the average per year. We have more than 200 members in the mailing list dedicated to on top, which is very, very active mailing list. And we have now uh, releasing uh, the, so actually the version four have been already, has been already released. We are still working on it and improving and optimizing some of the, of the processes in this release and working, as I mentioned before, on an extension toward multidimensional data and raster data. This is the developer community behind somehow. It's not just uh, we are here in Bolzano developing the tool. So there are companies such as Ontotex that are other institution, research institutions behind working on it. Some of them are more on the theoretical foundations of the BKG approach, such as the colleagues in Birbeck, for example, Zakariashev and, uh, and Konchakov and Roman. Uh, some other are more on the implementation side of, of this adventure, but they all collaborate quite actually closely together. So these are my take home messages. I was extremely, uh, let's say, uh, I, I'm late, I know. So I just want to tell you that VKG is nowadays a mature technology. So if you want to embrace this approach, the technology is there. The community behind the technology is also there and they can help you actually all, uh, to solve your somehow challenges or data integration and data access issue. Thank you for your attention and uh, I, I'm glad actually to receive your comments or questions or... Thank you very much, Alessandro, for, for this uh, presentation. So as you said, we are now uh, at our question and comment sessions, and I will start Great. with Sarah. Hello, I have a question about the, the ontology. So how to update the ontology in the case of VK, v, virtual knowledge graph uh, mm -hmm. if it does not cover all data sources? I see at least two scenarios. So one scenario, you basically have to introduce uh, uh, an additional data source, which is somehow not overlapping with the data sources. Oh, oh man, this is not really important. So you have this additional data source to introduce in your systems. Uh, what you have to do is to take care of the fact that the ontology you are already using cover somehow the information. So is, is, let me say, big enough to cover also the data and the information that are present in this additional data source. And then the only things that you have to do is to specify the suitable mappings for this new, for the additional data source. And uh, the more tricky, actually, the second more tricky scenario is where actually uh, the data source is not actually covered by the ontology you are, you are already using. And these means, or, or also in total somehow, so 100% outside your, the coverage of the ontology, or also partially outside the coverage of the ontology. So in this case, you will have to update your ontology. So to extend your ontology in order to cover this additional data. 
together with the mappings, of course. So the good, the good things, if to summarize, about the VKG approach is that it's very modular. So you don't need somehow. So if you have, if you are in an organization or in a project and you have 15 different data sets, data sources that you want somehow to provide access to and to integrate, you don't have somehow to wait until the 15th, let's say, mm -hmm. data source mapped and, and set in order to somehow run your system or appreciate, let's say, the benefit of your system. You can, in a modular way, you can start with the first one, then you can have the second one, the third one, the fourth one, and at each step, you are somehow, uh, you don't have somehow to, to throw away uh, work that you have in the step before. Okay. Does this somehow reply your, your question? So, so if I understand good, so the updating of the ontology will be uh, semi-automatic, if I understand uh, uh, correctly. I mean, uh, for example, if I have uh, the data source that, that, that are not in the knowledge graph because with RML, I want to map this, uh, this ontology with with the data source in order to create my knowledge graph. So uh, this is the, the case of RML. If I don't have this concept or relations in the ontology, I need to update the ontology in order to, to, to map, to, to do this mapping between data sources and ontology. So the yeah. updating of the ontology, uh, it will be semi-automatic or manually. Okay, this is this is yet another question because I didn't mention yeah. <laughs> automatization of the process. <laughs> uh, but thank you for the question because actually it's part of our current job. So we actually are working on semi-automatic, let's say, generation of mappings and ontologies from the data sources. Okay, okay. so we have prototypes that we are already using internally that generates automatically the ontology out of a certain data source of the, a given data source and the suitable mappings the mapping statements between the data source and the ontology okay is i mean the fully automatization of this process is really 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 difficult almost impossible i would say because uh, the automatic uh, solution for the generation of the ontology and the mappings, basically what, what they do is that is they create an ontology that we call the, from time to time in the literature, you can find this term database schema ontology. Okay, so the automatic process, the automatic algorithms generates an ontology that resembles 100% the scheme of the data source. And this is not usually what you want to give your final users, your geologists, your domain experts, right? Because, I mean, the terminology of this ontology will be the one of the database, provided that actually the prototypes that we are working on gives you the possibility to rename Okay, the headers of the columns, you can actually specify that the name of a certain table is not one, two, three underscore ABC, but it's dog or car or person, but the structure you hand up is really the structure of the database schema. So if you follow this uh, process somehow, this way of doing, then you semi-automatically generate the mappings and these specific kind of ontology. Then you will have on the other side a domain ontology or that you really want to use to access your data. And what is still missing is an alignment between the automatically generated ontology and this domain ontology that we want to use. Again, this alignment can be done manually but there are also nowadays automatic tools such as log map, for example, yeah. or logic map, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. Log map. With the name, yeah, sorry. And thanks for the suggestion that can support you in this step. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thanks to you. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, Sarah. So I will now give the floor to Kimberly Godwin. Yeah, not, not so much a question. I've um, played with something that is associated with Neo4j before, so using Cypher. Uh, and there's a drag and drop tool for creating small graphs that can be imported into Cypher, but also it can be used to import, uh, generate queries in Cypher that can be used to query a larger uh, Neo4j graph. I'm just wondering if something like that would help bridge the gap between the domain experts and the knowledge that they're trying to access. Just, just as a way of sort of very yeah, quickly yeah, yeah. I mean, letting non-experts access the, the information. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I fully agree. I fully agree. I mean, 90% uh, of the projects I've been participating during the last uh, eight years, they, they included somehow the development of visual interface to help the final user, the domain expert, to, uh, to query the data in such a way that they were not somehow forced to learn <laughs> neither Cypher nor Sparkle. So you are right on that. And I fully agree. So visual interfaces are, are a big, big actor here. Uh, they, I mean, up to my experience, uh, they, they may have the, the form of a dashboard, okay? But they could also be a combination, for example, of natural language-based interface and visual, let's say, representation of data. I spent five years, actually, in my past career working with experts in data visualization to create, uh, let's say, the most beautiful, the most efficient uh, 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 visual interface for the final users of our, let's say, VKG-based solution. And they are from engineering uh, to Roman Empire history. <laughs> so very diverse. Thank you. We are actually, just, just to conclude, we are actually as a group here in Bolzano, we are part of a project called iNode which is a project funded to provide services and solution for the European uh, Open Science Cloud, EOSC. And uh, in the consortium we are working with, uh, there are colleagues uh, developing exploration, visual exploration interfaces that are connected with our BKG, with our own top system and also colleagues working on plain natural language interface. So interfaces that can actually allow you to write down in, in English or in another language, natural language, your query. This exactly to bypass the difficulties, the technical difficulties of learning Sparkle or other similar query language. Thank you. Then the next question is from Marie Angelique. Yeah, hi, thank you for your presentation. Hi. So I, 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 yeah, I have two questions. So my first question is like most of the data in agriculture are still in Excel. I mean, they are not even in, in databases. So it's just Excel file. So I was wondering if the, the yeah, the approach that you, you described uh, was working with that because you mentioned r 2 RML and from the list that you showed that in your last slide, it was just, um, um, yeah, databases system that were supported by it. So I was wondering about that. The answer is yes. I mean, no problem. We have several active projects dealing with spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet or data in this format. One thing that I didn't mention before is, is, is really about this, uh, the way we deal with this, with this heterogeneity in data format. So basically on top, our system stays on top of what is called a federation engine. Okay, so there are technology called the federation engine that take care of somehow federating different data sources in different formats and expose to on top a relational, let's say, view or relational representation of all these data sources. So we are in particular these days working heavily, I would say, with TAID, 
with the, the nodal, which is already integrated in on top. If you go to the on top web page, you will find a version of on top which actually integrates already the nodal, which is one of these federation engine, and also Dremio. We are also working with Dremio. So due to the fact that these federation engines are able to ingest spreadsheet files and CSV files and other kind of files and expose to on top a relational representation of all of them, we are fine. Yeah. Okay, so we can use on top, we can integrate spreadsheet files, we can, we can work with them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for, for your answer that answer perfectly. So, and my second question would be more on what are the advantages of using like virtual knowledge graph uh, versus materialized ones? Uh, I mean, you mentioned that uh, when the data are updated regularly, I mean, that saves you the fact that you don't have to uh, update your materialized knowledge graph again. But uh, in terms of performances, is it the same? I mean, it's still, is it still good? One main reason is about freshness of the data, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the data are updated frequently, I will, I will never go for a materialized approach. Second, it's that there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an issue related with the, with the rights. Let's say most of the time we are not allowed to touch the data sources. We can see them, we can send queries to them, but we are not allowed to write on them, for example. So in order to, let's say, keep the data sources in the place, in their original place, okay, the virtual approach is the right one because you don't need to, to touch them. They stay in their server and the data are retrieved only when, when they are needed. So in the materialized approach, you enter, so in order to have a materialized version of your knowledge graph, you have to somehow execute an extraction and transform load, an ETL, kind of an ETL approach. So you are going to copy your data. You are going to store this copy somewhere I mean, and for privacy reasons, most, uh, I mean, a lot of companies, a lot of actors we, actors we work with, they don't like at all this idea that the data are copied and then stored somewhere else. Even if it's a server, an internal server by them. So it's going to cost this the cost of the server, the cost of the hardware, the cost of the process. So if you work in a very specific scenario, okay, you might end up with queries that are extremely costly because of the nature of the query or because in order to execute the query and answer the information need of your user, you have to, let's say, manipulate or massage a lot the data that you are retrieving from the data sources. So from time to time, you can also have a mixed approach when you keep most of the, the knowledge graph virtual and part of this knowledge graph materialized because so due to, let's say, uh, for the sake of efficiency of your system. So also the mixed approach is viable. Okay. Thank you. We are experimenting this approach, for example, this way of doing with raster data, for example, or vector data, geospatial data. So there are functions required by the, by the user query that in order to be answered, they require a lot of time. So we materialize somehow the results of the data manipulation by this function in specific table, in additional tables that we store within our system and for the sake of the system so that we are able to, to answer the query in a more efficient way. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, Mari. So you, Linda, Mary. you have some questions. Hi. Yeah, uh, actually the question is if it's uh, um, good to combine uh, the material and the virtual approach. And he just 
response to it's the very, question. Yeah, yeah, okay. it's very good. It's very useful when it's needed. Yeah. Yeah. So this is somehow this this is where actually the expertise of the of the VKG of the people knowing the VKG approach comes comes out. So in order to somehow discriminate between which is the best solution in a in in, in the specific case, of mm. course. But the general rule is the one that I was mentioning before. Mm. Which you can advise for uh, to handle, for example, um, times uh, series data, for example, to have uh, sensors that where we have a lot of data, like, like temperature or consumption. Uh, uh, this is actually what we are working right now. So we have a collaboration with uh, the Earth Observation Institute uh, here in Bolzano and also with the Sensing Center Institute still here in Bolzano to try to understand how to, how to deal in the most efficient way with this, with this kind of data. Because I mean, at the moment, I can tell you that we are somehow able to deal with them, but we are not actually extremely satisfied by the performance of the system yeah. because the queries are extremely costly. So we are working on that. <laughs> so it's possible, definitely. It's something that is possible to do, but we want uh, we we don't want actually to leave the users more than two minutes in front of the screen waiting for our results. And this is what happened right now, in some cases. So what we are to be really transparent, extremely transparent, what we are doing nowadays is to is to set up experiments in order to understand which are the queries on temporal series that actually generates this extra cost and try to understand whether via materialization or via optimizations of the query writing, we can actually perform better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Alessandro. You. So we have two questions left. Uh, one from Crawford Rivi. So he has left, but I will ask his question. So he said, you spoke a lot about the RBDM and the associated schema. What about no SQL approaches that tend to be schema lit and even schema free? One thing that I can say about is, for example, that we have a wrapper for MongoDB, which is a no SQL database system that is working. So MongoDB data sources are also somehow can also be mapped and integrated into on top. JSON mm -hmm. is a NoSQL database or format for NoSQL uh, repository. I would say yes. And we work with JSON too. Okay, so, so uh, on the top can be connected to uh, JSON format. Yes, yes. The only difference is that we actually, we are, we, we are currently, we access JSON file, for example, via these, uh, the experience they say the use of this federation engine. Well, actually, as for MongoDB, because of historical reasons, because we started working on this NoSQL uh, database technology years ago, before we entered, before we started working with the federation engine. So as for MongoDB, we have uh, our, let's say, implemented wrapper that is uh, somehow uh, a technology that, translate Sparkle query into queries of uh, MongoDB sources. But yeah, I know, also know that in the community, in the developer community, there are other colleagues uh, which are interested in developing and they are actually developing further wrappers for other NoSQL sources. Thank you. And so the last question is from Sarah. Uh, about the, the materialized the knowledge graph, I don't know if you have uh, some um, recommendation about the triple stores mm. or not <laughs> for big <laughs> semantic data. <laughs> no, I don't no. have any special suggestion on that. I worked in the past with Virtuoso mostly and Jena. In both cases, I ended up <laughs> upset <laughs> so, by the performance of the triple store, by the support uh, behind. Uh, mm -hmm. If I had to compare today, yeah. 
the efficiency of a, of, a, of a relational database management system and any triple store in, in the world. I mean, there is no, no, no way to compare them, yeah. no way. So it looks like uh, they, I mean, from time to time, they look like toys, you know? So uh, are, you, are you playing with the toys or is something serious, robust? Mm -hmm. A lot of sparkle endpoint on the web that we really are interested in because they contain a lot of valuable information. They are implemented by means of these triple stores. Mm -hmm. And I mean, most of the time I send a query and I got kicked out because of time limits or because of limits on the number of triples that, I that, 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 that the system should actually expose to me or other issues, so. Yeah, but it is interesting, maybe for the, this part of materialized knowledge graph, for example, if you want to, uh, to have some analytics in, in, in uh, historical uh, semantic data, maybe it is interesting to have all the, hist the history of this data or knowledge in this uh, in this materialized knowledge graph, because with the, the virtual one, uh, we don't have this history. So we we, we treat the, the, the data and uh, and that's it. I fully agree. I simply I'm not an expert on this. I'm not working on implementation of this kind of technology, and mm. I'm a I'm a I'm just a user. Yeah. And my experience is, is quite bad. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jackson. And you can actually materialize your data before you map them to, a, to the ontology. So if you are able somehow, if you are allowed to create additional data sources that can be in a relational model or in no SQL model, mm -hmm. you can materialize your data there and maintain the efficiency of your overall system. This is what we do, actually. So when we materialize something, we materialize in relational database. Okay. We are our set. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Alessandro. So I don't see any more questions coming in the chat. So thank you a lot, uh, Alessandro, for taking the time to prepare the, your presentation and for staying longer to, to answer all the questions. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation again, for the questions, mm -hmm. for the wonderful organizations, and I hope to see you soon again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.